Dr. Shewal Kandelwal is a consultant in uh, thoracic surgery at Medanta the Medicity. He started off being a laparoscopic surgeon. He's a very proficient laparoscopic surgeon. And somewhere along the way, I think he saw light of the day, light at the end of the tunnel, and he said, I want to be a thoracic surgeon. So he's come and he's been working with us. And uh, really, most of the initial part of the operation, i.e. ports, docking, uh, almost everything is done by him. He really guides the whole thing. And more importantly, intraoperatively, when we're doing a robotic lobectomy particularly, or robotic lung resection, he is at the table uh, putting in the staplers, firing the staplers, and he's the guy who really does... The Yesterday somebody asked me a question, is Dr. Shewal doing the operation or are you doing the operation? And the reality of uh, a robotic lobectomy is that uh, at the console I'm only doing the dissection, but Dr. Shewal is doing the operation at the table. So he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, patient positioning and uh, port placement and docking. Hi, good morning everybody. Thank you sir for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak on this prestigious forum. Once Dr. Sangeeta's job is over, my job start for the robotic port placement and docking. So I shall be talking about the robotic port pl placement and docking the robotic thoracic surgery. I am working in the department of minimally invasive thoracic surgery and robotic surgery at Medanta the Medicity. We have a successfully running program of robotic thoracic surgery and we have the privilege of using the latest Da Vinci HDSI robotic system. Robot has various applications in thorax, including surgeries for lung, mediastinum, and diaphragm. In our experience with lung surgeries, we have successfully performed robotic lobectomy for lung cancer, followed by robotic systematic mediastinal nodal dissection. We have also performed robotic lobectomy in a patient with aspergilloma, and to our surprise, we found that robot was an excellent tool for tackling dense and vascular mediastinal adhesions. We have also performed ectopic mediastinal parathyroid adenoma. Talking about the principles, the procedures are essentially done in general anesthesia using single lung ventilation, using a double lumen tube. This has already been discussed in detail by Dr. Sangeeta. Most of the procedures except the lesions of the anterior mediastinum are performed in the full lateral decubitus position. Additional flexion is done at the site of the thoracotomy so that the intercostal spaces are, wide, are opened up. Bony prominences and pressure points are carefully padded. Bimanual examination is done under GA for, for accurate port planning. Our principle is that the view should be same as that you see in the open surgery. The intercostal spaces should be open wide so that the ports can move adequately and the shoulder should be above the iliac crest so that and the hip comes down below the shoulder so that the camera arm do not hit the hip when you are visualizing the apical region. This is very important otherwise the robotic arm will clash with the skin and will cause bruises and the other injuries. The table should be broken at two places. Firstly at the site where you make the incision for the thoracotomy so that the rib intercostal spaces are widened up and secondly at the hip so as to bring the lower extremities parallel to the ground. Bean bag is an ideal thing to use. We are about to get it for our department, but at the moment we place a bolster anteriorly and fix the patient to the table using a leukoplast. These are our typical Indian methods we devised it over time. You can see, appreciate the table breaks. The first port is introduced is a five millimeter port at the mid axillary line in the sixth intercostal space, through which a five millimeter camera is introduced in the thoracic cavity which is examined and rest other ports are introduced in the vision. There is a no-fly zone of 3 cm parallel to the vertebral column in which no ports should be placed because there is intercostal space is very narrow there. The other two ports are 12 mm camera port at the 7th intercostal space. There is a difference in the placement of the ports in the traditional VATS and the robotic surgery. In VATS, we have to create a triangulation. The camera port is the lowermost, and the other working ports are in the sixth or the fifth intercostal space, depending on the surgery you are doing. But in robotics, all these three ports are pair in the same intercostal space. The other two working ports are eight millimeter ports in the same seventh intercostal space. And 
additional 12 millimeter port is made for assistant to work to do the necessary suctioning, passing of the stapler, retraction, and that is made in the anteriorly in the ninth intercostal space. The most important point is that the distance between the two ports should always be more than nine centimeters. It prevents the clashing of the robotic arms. You can see the no-fly area. The thoracotomy line is always marked. We always make sure to do the preoperative drawings after the induction. And you can see the thoracotomy line and the tip of the scapula. These are the sites marked for the placement of the ports. This is an schematic representation how we place the ports. I will show you the real-time picture. These are the ports. You can see the tip of the scapula is marked. Here there is slight variation with, with I have told you now. This is a camera port. This is the instrument port number two. This is the instrument port number one. The distance is nine centimeter. This is the assistant port of 12 millimeter. Sometimes we use a port of five millimeter posteriorly when we need additional retraction. As in laparoscopy, we always use preemptive analgesia. A local anesthetic, anesthetic uh, point two five percent sensor cane is infiltrated. You can see the air bubble coming out ind indicates that you are in the pleura and uh, the infiltration is done at the level of pleura to block the intercostal nerves and intercostal muscles and the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. This is very well documented in laparoscopy but papers are coming for thoracoscopic use as well. This is the incision given that only skin and subcutaneous tissue are cut then we do a dissection to, do, to split the muscles, we never cut them. And then we enter into the thoracic cavity. I have mentioned previously about to introduce a 5 millimeter camera through this port, but in our practice, we make a 8 millimeter or 10 millimeter port first, and then we introduce our finger through it to rule out any adhesions underneath. See. We rule out the adhesions because tuberculosis being endemic, we have to rule it out. Otherwise, inadvertently, you do the lung injury. Then we introduce a, a port and the thoracic cavity is examined and subsequent ports are introduced under vision after the infiltration of the local anesthetic. Now I will show you a video in which Dr. Khan will beautifully describe about the port placement. So let me just talk. These are the four ports that we have put in line. This one is an 8 millimeter robotic port, which we put in the above the seventh rib. This one, uh, nine centimeters from there, we have put a 12 millimeter uh, port. The 12 millimeter port will go onto the camera arm of the robot. Then I've put an 8 millimeter port nine centimeters down. This is above the eighth rib, and this will have instrument number two. And I've put an extra. 5 millimeter port. Now this 5 millimeter port I can either use it as a robotic arm port for which I'll have to change to 8 millimeter or my assistant will use only a grasper device through this to give me traction. And this is an extra, this triangle is important, the triangle between port 1, 2 and 3. This triangle is important, this is at 9 centimeters, 9 centimeters and this is a 12 millimeter port which is my assistant's port. So Dr. Shehwal will have access through this port for giving me the staplers and retraction and things like that. Okay. Once all the ports are placed, now the time has come for the docking of the robot. The basic principles are align the patient camera arm, target the anatomy, your center point and the camera port. The table has to be at the lowest position. The Position patient cart arm to clear the patient, meaning this that uh, the arm should be placed, should have a free movement all around, and it should not hit the patient at any time. Push all the lights aside, and the cart approaches from the left side of the head at 15 degree anteriorly in case of lobectomies. For thymectomies, it comes perpendicularly to the long axis of the patient. Position camera arm setup joint on opposite side of Da Vinci instrument arm. Use the clutch arm maneuver to dock the camera and the instrument arms. Align the robotic arm parallel to the ports. Maximize the spacing between the instrument's arm that is 9 cm we adopt. Another video showing the docking. The robot is 
gradually coming to the patient's head, head end. See, it is 15 degree anteriorly. First, the camera arm is docked, and then other instruments are docked, and under vision, the instruments are introduced. The robot is fully docked. This is the final appearance you, appearance you have after docking. Talking about robotic thymic sur surgery, we are routinely using robot for all our thymic surgeries. We have experience in performing robotic thymectomy for myasthenia gravis, robotic resection of thymoma, robotic metastectomy for thymic cancer, robotic resection of mediastinal ectopic parathyroid adenoma. The ideal patient for a robotic thymectomy should be a young patient with no previous long-term history of steroid therapy, patient having early onset of disease benefit the most after surgery, and if they have acetylcholine receptor positive status, they benefit the more, the most. Sorry. This is the, in our practice, most of the times we do thymectomy from the right side. The patient is placed in the supine position, the right arm is abducted, and the arm should not go beyond 90 degrees. The right side is partially tilted up by placing a sand back underneath, and the table is also tilted over. This is a schematic representation of the position of the ports. A 12 mm camera port and 8 mm working ports are used. The location of the ports, these are location of the ports, second, fourth, and sixth intercostal space, but depending upon the every chest is different, these are variable locations. The robot is docked in the similar fashion as shown previously. Whole of the thymus, including both horns and all the pericardial fat from neck, neck to diaphragm, in between, between the two phrenics are excised. The specimen is then delivered into a custom-made custom delivery bag, which is del delivered out from the camera port because it is a big gas port. And then we take out the specimen through the bag. This easily comes out through this 12 millimeter port. This is a specimen we have retrieved, typical edge shape of the thymus and all of the pre-pericardial fat. In our practice, we remove the drain the next day in the morning and the patient is ready for discharge next morning. The cosmetic results after robotic surgery are very good and the patients are very happy after seeing their scars. We routinely record all our procedures and the most important point of learning is to edit these videos. Thank you. Excellent, Shaival. Well, that was a very, very good discussion, uh, very good presentation. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, paper is open for questions from the floor. For the right and the left side uh, lobectomies, uh, for upper and lower, you have the same ports? Uh, yes. In Do you ever find cases. difficulty in uh, dissecting, dissecting the inferior pulmonary ligament uh, through this? Uh, in fact, yesterday's case, uh, we had to change the ports slightly because uh, of the adhesions anteriorly and the lima to LED. And because of the change of that position, we found that we could not go down to yeah, dissect that is, the that inferior is usual problem yeah, it, it was a struggle yeah. at that stage but uh, the other lobectomies that we've done what happens is if you grasp the lung and lift it away then it's easy to get into that space but instead of putting ports in the same line if the lower part the actually the uh, ports towards the uh, lower and anteriorly are put in the lower uh, ribs or the other way around hmm. i think the dissection of the inferior pulmonary ligament uh, is easier yeah i i, I learned my how to place my ports by uh, 
discussion with the American people and uh, they, they have done more than 100 lobectomies, robotic lobectomies, and they don't change their ports. So I, I, I have not felt the necessity to change the ports. In my practice, what I try to do is I try and keep things standardized. It, it, it's really important to do the same thing time and time again. Unless and until I'm struggling, I'll change. But I try to keep the things standardized so that when he's doing, you know, he's setting up the case or things like that, I, I don't have to worry about the thing. So that's what I do. Uh, yes, you can change the ports up and down. Uh, if you look at VATS lobectomy practices, people go from you know, front, back, Yeah, actually up, lobectomy down. is different because the robot is not yeah. involved in that. Sure. Uh, but I personally, I, I I have not found a problem as yet. But if I do find a problem, I'll change the port. I'll put in an extra port. Okay, because we did f a couple of cases at uh, Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute. The, what I, I found difficulty in dissection of the inferior pulmonary ligament. So I thought probably the lower, the ports uh, should be placed a little lower. Okay. And how do you select lobectomy cases, especially for malignancy, uh, uh, whether to do robotic or to whether to do VATS? Uh, when I started the VATS program, personally, I, my cases were, uh, initially of course they were only the small nodules at the periphery, but after that, uh, I think after the first 20 odd cases, we just sequentially did everything by VATS. Th there was really no case selection. For central In the tumor? robot, now that we have started the robotic thoracic program, uh, I am doing them by robotics if the patient can afford it, because there is an extra 50,000 cost to the patient. Uh, personally, I would prefer to do everything by robotics. Uh, central tumors? Uh, central tumors. In VATS lobectomies, we've done about uh, 14 or 15 central tumors by uh, VATS lobectomy. So, it's, it's all a matter of experience. You know what uh, happens? Like the more comfortable you get. Sometimes, like uh, on visualization, because there's no feel uh, in the robotic surgery. Sure. Because sometimes when you visualize it, it, it appears normal. But when you actually go and feel in the central hilum, then mm -hmm. you feel okay probably the peribronchial disease is more, we have to go a little more higher. Or, or probably we may have to uh, on table, pneumonectomy. Yeah. On table, I always do a preoperative bronchoscopy. I personally do it. If I'm going to be operating, I am the one who looks at the bronchus. If I at any point am not comfortable with what's happening at the robot robotic end, I scrub in and take the do undock the robot and go in by bats. So it's, it's all, uh, you know, you have to be open for suggestion. The bottom line is conversion is not a failure of the procedure. Yeah, that's that's the biggest uh, point that I like to make in all my teachings. That conversion is not a failure of the procedure. Don't be hesitant. Go back to VATS. So it's not about the technique. It's what is right for the patient. So How about uh, incomplete fissure is, is a problem? Uh, no, incomplete fissure is actually not a problem. In fact, uh, there is a technique called as uh, fissure last technique. So you really don't go into the fissure. You go at the hilum in the front, you go at the hilum at the back, and you get the structure sequentially. So in a VAT stroke robotic lobectomy, your principle of uh, lobectomy is not the classical where you get the vein first, and then you get the artery, and then you get the bone. You know, it changes. So whatever structure you can see, and safely get, you get. And so there is a technique called as fissure last technique. So you just don't touch the fissure. And nowadays we do that. We just don't go into the fissure until and unless it's completely developed. So you go to the hilum, get the structure sequentially, and then the fissure is stapled the last. Sir, you said that the, the robotic cut comes in 15 degree from the head end. It is starting on the right side of the patient. Uh, I'm, standing from the the interior I'm standing at the back of the patient. At the back of the patient. Yeah, Where yeah. is the anesthesia cart? Anesthesia yes. cart is at the foot end. Foot end. Foot okay. end. We clear the whole head. We clear the whole head area right. and we give an extra long tubing which goes all the way to the face. It's a challenge for the anesthetist. That's why you need two anesthetists in table for a lobectomy. Because one has to be at the foot end with the monitors and the other one has to be at the head end to make sure tube issues and things like that. So it, it is, it does require more personnel, it does require more expertise, uh, should be done only in specialized centers, I think so. Only, only people who are doing them regularly should do it. Does not mean that we are not encouraging more people to do it. I think everybody should start, but you know, do it in centralized uh, institutes, rather than small nursing homes. Police Camera sir. ports are the, just the ones which are available okay, you in You can't theater. talk them to the routine like the laparoscopic ports, your robotic ports. Uh, no. Robotic no. <coughs> No, no, no. That. The arms you can't dock through the robotic, but the camera goes through as routine. 
laparoscopic port. But in, in VATS lobectomy, I don't use ports. Uh, I, I only use a single metallic port for the camera. And then the two arms, I leave the thing open because I don't use CO2. You don't really need CO2. So you just open it and I put four stitches onto that port so that the port you stays mean, open. When the lung is uh, collapsed completely, even you, do, you don't need any port there for the assistance. You can pass your instruments directly as we do it in VATS. I am Dr. Prasad from Hyderabad. Uh, Hi, Dr. I mean, uh, does it matter whether you are doing a right-sided lobectomy or left-sided lobectomy, the position of the patient cut? I mean, do you do it as a mirror image? Yeah, mirror image. Yeah, yeah. Mirror image. yeah, yeah and yeah, the yeah. second thing is, what was that thing that you put around the ports? There is some... That, that is not my... That picture is from the US. That is called as... It's a protector. And it's something that you fold and it's like a bag. It's like a uh, umbrella device. Uh, not an umbrella. What do you call it? Uh, it's called wound protector. Yeah, it's a wound protector, it's, uh, but... Uh, it's it's uh, got two rings. Yeah, it's, it's like a dumbbell protector. It's a dumbbell protector. So there's one yeah, ring outside. It's a dumbbell shaped protector, two rings. So you put it inside. So you just press the ring. It's like compressible ring. You press it, it passes inside. And uh, it's something like hand port device, a smaller version. So it, it just opens inside and then it traverses the wound and it opens outside. The purpose is that uh, they say in malignancy cases, when you're instruments are touching the tumor area when you're taking out the instruments and putting them in back and forth uh, you don't want these theoretically tumor cells shed and onto the instruments to come in contact with the wound and also when you are removing the specimen of course you will have it in the specimen so that is the purpose of this wound protector if, if you have an incident of back breaking while you're retrieving the specimen and things like that, I would strongly recommend you use betadine and hydrogen peroxide in the wound just to wash it out, okay? Because you don't want wood uh, seeding of ports with uh, uh, cancer cells. I've had one case of port side metastasis in the VAT series. May I, may Please, I add to, to that uh, special, um, let's say, troca um, configuration? This, uh, the company is Applied Medical, um, and it's, as far as I know, and we, we use that, we began to use it, this is the method for all the teams uh, working on two incision lobectomies and single incision lobectomies. Then you have a perfect entrance into the thoracic cavity for the special uh, traditional instruments, very long, very shaped, um, to be outside, working without sticking your hands inside at a single incision um, and with the applied medical entrance. This is very perfect. For anyone who's wanting to start this program, uh, it's not just a trained anesthetist or a trained surgeon. Another trained person is absolutely vital and as you rightly said, after the anesthetist is done with his or her job, it's the, your colleague who takes over and uh, he's the one who actually decides all the ports and this that and actually manages the show there while you are away on the console and every team has to have one such member who should be a regular part if he's changing every day and every day you have new people joining in this program cannot succeed so you have him similarly i have dr roman here who's actually sitting here so he's been a part of our program since the time we started on most of the thoracoscopy program and robotic program so he understands what you want, you understand what he can do, and there is a drill which is rehearsed between the two that in case of a mishap, these would be the steps, one, two, three. If there is a bleeding, this is what he would do, this is what I would do, which only occurs when you have the same person present all the time. And person also should understand. It should not be a novice assistant. It should be somebody who's been through that for some time. This is absolutely vital for the starting of a program. So one more thing I would like to add. See the, the surgeon sitting at the patient side knows what is happening probably at the console, but the surgeon sitting at the console is not aware of what is happening at the patient side. So it is the proper communication and the understanding Absolutely. between the two sure, sure. to make the procedure successful. Sure. Actually. Very often I, I tell him do something and uh, you know, he's not doing it because, to, because I'm looking down and I don't know that the arm is clashing. There. Do you know sure, what I mean? Sure, 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 it happens. So, uh, Numerous times it happens over that... Over time uh, we have evolved and overcome this problem. Sure, <laughs> sure. In fact, what he did was, uh, you know, he got a, a procedure recorded from outside of what he was doing. 
And then he said, sir, see this. Yeah. This is the problem. You don't seem to understand when you're on the console. What is the problem that I'm facing? Uh, and it is absolutely It is, right. is mandatory to have proper to communication and understanding of yeah. each other. Actually. One of the problems my, my, my colleague is uh, never interested in doing is uh, taking out the hook to clean it. Because as I was telling you yesterday, numerous times we've had this problem. You take out the hook, you clean it, and you put it back, and it says instrument not recognized. Yeah. You take it out again, five, six times you have to do, and it still it says instrument not recognized. So you put it aside, you get another hook, you put it, and then you start with the procedure. Next procedure, you use that hook, it works. So why at that point of time machine was, so Dr. Roman is always very wary of removing the hook for cleaning it. And uh, these are issues which, which will come when you start a program. And therefore, anesthetist, surgeon, and his colleague, these three are the vital components of a program. Uh, Jens. But, but what you addressed just now, uh, something like a, uh, like a small difference between the, the uh, operation uh, surgeon's console and the table is uh, um, that is um, at the same time one of the main uh, critical points for robotic surgery at the moment. And therefore, it's, I, um, am I right? It's, it's our uh, opinion uh, just now that there's until now no place for uh, single surgeon surgery with a robotic to be uh, com uh, to be aimed at uh, because this is um, in my opinion too dangerous and not um, prepared um, this the whole system uh, requires a two surgeons approach at the moment you're now looking at the latest generation with two consoles being there do you think that's going to change having two surgeons at the console versus you would you still want somebody at with the patient bedside uh, they have not as yet developed uh, the stapling devices for the for the robots and for cases like lobectomy and things i th i still think you need an experienced guy at the bedside but having two consoles maybe the way forward i don't know maybe it's uh, intitu's way to sell more consoles uh, i personally would not buy a second console in my theater except for teaching purpose. I, I cannot imagine why I would need another guy on another console. Uh, I, I, that's my opinion. I, I don't know what you feel, Jens. But it's very interesting the, uh, to, to hear both of you because the, the original, uh, it, it would make sense to, to believe in, in robotic uh, technology, surgical technology, that would mean you accept that there is something in it that you may sit at the console and do an operation either as rehearsal or as um, getting acquainted to the certain technique at the second console. It is certainly not the place to replace the surgeon at the table. It's, it's the same thing sitting two of them at the console, learning the, the, the business at the console. Yeah, I think it's only for education, to be really honest. The, the person at the console is only doing the console part. The cart still needs, has instruments, yeah, and absolutely. unless they come up with a mechanism to, for the robot to itself pick up the instrument from the trolley <laughs> and change it, which is, I think, quite well, a while away, another robot for you, that. you do need, uh, yeah, you need another <laughs> robot for that. You do need a person who can change, you know, you will say change instrument, clean instrument, yeah. camera cleaning, camera fog. Do you feel that camera fogging occurs more often in the chest than in the abdomen? No, I have no, always. I, uh, I am not experienced with abdominal surgery, okay, I, but I, in I do abdominal. I always have camera fogging, but in robotics, I'm not having. I have camera always fogging, experienced that when I'm doing laparoscopy, per 15 minutes or per half an hour requirement of, uh, I mean, changing, taking out and cleaning the camera, it's far more in the chest. I don't know yeah, for yeah, what. I, I agree with you, and uh, but in the robotic, it's less. I feel. I think, I think it's because I think it's due of the CO2 exactly. It's the CO2 which actually and thymectomy when we use CO2, it's much less, and then compared in, to lobectomy. In fact, Shaival was suggesting to me that in, in your VATS cases, why don't you keep a low dose CO2? Go? Even though it escapes out, it might uh, help the, the sure camera being clear. I, I don't know. We could try that. Okay, that that might be the point. That that might be the point. You're you're right. Yeah, but okay. but within the robot, there is a difference between abdomen and chest. Oh, we've used both. 
Okay. So in the chest we feel it needs more often, but then I think it's to do with CO2. In the chest when we have used CO2 as we do for thymectomy, the requirement is less, but when it's lobectomy where we are not using CO2, it happens more often. So probably CO2 has some, some role to play. Uh, okay, thank you very much everybody and thank you Sheval for a really nice presentation. I, I, I enjoyed it and it really has raised a lot of issues, so very well done to you.